All right, so here we go. Let's get jump right into Genesis 26. Let's look down here at verse number 1. It says, And there was a famine in the land, beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. Now, if you remember, this is the same king, at least it's the same name, Abimelech. I assume it's the same guy, if not his son, but, but I believe this is the same man, Abimelech the king of the Philistines, that was also king when Abraham was sojourning or, or staying temporarily in Gerar, in this foreign country. And, um, you know, he, he leaves where he was staying because there was a famine, so he, he travels. And look at what God tells him. It says in verse 2, And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. So, there's this importance of not going into Egypt, not going into that land. Egypt is always referred to, or is, is frequently, uh, you know, if not always, a symbol of the world. It's a symbol of the heathen. It's a symbol of you know, an ungodly place, not, not to rely on them for their strength or their horses or their might or anything like that. And he's telling them, look, I want you to stay here. I don't want you. I want, actually, I want you to stay in a land where I tell you of. Don't go into Egypt. Now, Egypt at this time was well watered. You know, I'm sure they weren't experiencing a famine. It would have been tempting for him to say, hey, well, we'll just go down into Egypt temporarily. But look at what he tells them in verse 3. He says, sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. He's saying Abraham was a great man. Abraham was God. He's a friend of God. He's called the friend of God. He obeyed God to a T. I mean, he, he, was, he was doing the hardest things that God asked him to do. When he asked him to offer up Isaac, his son, he didn't bat an eye. He went to do it. He had total faith. He believed in God. And he knew how to raise his household. He raised his family well. He, he taught the fear of the Lord. And because Abraham was, was so faithful to God, he says, that's why, you know, you're going to receive this blessing. I'm going to bless you because of your father Abraham. Now, what I want you to, to keep in your mind as we read through this chapter is the total, I mean, this is almost a duplicate story from Genesis 21. Except now it's happening with Isaac instead of with Abraham. And we see how Isaac is faced with new challenges. And you know what? Isaac's his own man. He's the son of Abraham, but going through all these different things, it's kind of like a testing ground. Is Isaac really his father's son? Is he going to behave in the same way that his father does? does? Did he gain the knowledge? Does he have the same heart that Abraham had? And we're going to see, you know, Isaac's a good, another great man. He's not, you know, he didn't fall away from, you know, by the wayside or, or you know, follow the wrong path. Uh, but it's, it's really interesting, all of the similarities when you look at these passages between Abraham and Isaac. Abraham, there was a famine and he went to sojourn. And this is just the very beginning. So now Isaac is doing the same thing. And God's telling him, okay, I want you to stay here. This is where I want you to be. This is God's will. This is God telling him, I want you to stay here. And Isaac listens to that. He doesn't go down in Egypt because God said not to do it. So he listens to him. And God also gives him that promise. He says, hey, you're going to get these blessings because your, your father listened to me, your father obeyed me, and I'm going to bless you. So I want you to stay right here and, and you're going to receive, you know, this is going to be the, your inheritance. But um, let's keep reading here. Verse 6, it says, And Isaac dwelt in Gerar, and the men of the place asked him of his wife. Now, does this sound familiar? And he said, she is my sister. Same exact thing that Abraham said. For he feared to say, she is my wife. Lest, said he, the men of the place should kill me for Rebekah, because she was fair to look upon. This is the exact same attitude. So we see here, Isaac really is his father's son, <laughs> even, down to, even down to some of the negative things, right? Now, I fully believe that neither Abraham or Isaac should have been 
saying this about their wives because of the fact that look at what could have happened. And, and we see that, you know, um, Abimelech even, even says this. Look, let's keep reading here in, in this passage. Verse 8 says, And it came to pass, when he had been there a long time, that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out at a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebekah's wife. So Abimelech's looking out the window. He's looking at him, wait a minute. And it says they're sporting. So like he's playing around with his wife, but in a way, you know, in a, in a way that husband's wife is like, that's not your sister, right? I mean, they're, they're goofing around, they're playing or whatever, but you could tell like that would be a pretty strange relationship if that was, if that was his sister. He's like, no, she's your wife, right? And he could see this. It's obvious by the way they're acting with each other. He's sporting with her. So he calls Isaac in verse 9. It says, And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety, she is thy wife. And how saidst thou, she is my sister? And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, lest I die for her. Now I brought this up in Genesis 21, but I feel like I need to bring it up again. Because to me, that's just a total lack of love for your wife to say, Well, I want her to lie about be, even being my wife. Because I'm afraid I might die for her. Ephesians chapter 5, great chapter about husbands and wife, tells us in verse 24, therefore, well, no, in verse 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. We ought to, as husbands, you ought to have a love for your wife where you are willing to lay down your life for your wife. That's the type of love that Jesus Christ had for us. Now, it doesn't mean you should just be like, just, wa just, just wishing to go out and die, right? Of course. But at the same time, you ought to be ready to do that and prepared to be able to do that. And you ought to be able to love your wife enough to say, no, this is my wife. And see, I, I think they should have been more like, no, this is my wife. And I'd rather die fighting to defend her if the, if the people of that land really were that wicked. Now, first of all, if the people of that land really were that wicked and God's telling you to stay in that land, do you think that they really are going to touch your wife? You know, have a little bit more faith in God and trust that He will protect you if this is God's will. They knew it was God's will. God told them He wanted them there. So if God wants you there, you shouldn't be, you know, lying about your wife. But secondly, you know, you ought to be willing to say, this is my wife. And I'm not gonna, I'm gonna dead sure make sure that nobody else is gonna be lying with my wife. Because if you already think that that something might happen, that they might kill you because your wife is beautiful, well, what's gonna what do you think is gonna happen when you say she's not my wife? If she's that beautiful, of course they're gonna try to, to, to take her to be one of theirs. Now you've gotten yourself in a much worse situation. But, that's, but this is exactly what he says, and he learned this from his dad. He learned a lot of good things from his dad. Unfortunately, he picked up this one too. Now, at least Abraham was able to say, well, she's my half-sister, so he wasn't quite lying, at least according to him, assuming he was telling the truth at that point. We don't know for sure. It doesn't give us the genealogy. But we know for a fact that Rebecca is not Isaac's sister. <laughs> that was his cousin or his second cousin. You know, it's like they were, they were related, but it was not his sister. So when... Uh, when this happens, you know, he says, well, why, why did you do this? He's like, she's not your sister. And Isaac said, well, you know, um, because I said, lest I die for her. Look at what Abimelech says in verse 10, though. And Abimelech said, what is this thou hast done unto us? One of the people might lightly have lying with thy wife, and thou shouldst have brought guiltiness upon us. Now, I think this is also one of the reasons why both Abraham and Isaac looked at the people and they're like, this is not a God-fearing people. Based on the statement that Abimelech said, he's like, well, one of the people might have lightly lied with her. Right? Well, when you have a, a culture or a group of people where committing fornication, because that's what they would have been doing by lying with his wife, where they're just like, well, someone might have just lightly lied. Yeah, he might have just, just taken her home and, and slept with her and li lying with your wife. Someone might have lightly done that. When the culture has this permissive, this just treating the sin of fornication so lightly. Well, yeah, it's not a God-fearing people. So you can kind of see where they're coming from, at least of, of their perception of these people. Now, at least 
they understood that adultery is wickedness because he said then he would have brought guiltiness upon us since she's thy wife. But they didn't seem to care that much. They didn't seem, fornication didn't seem to be that big of a deal. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 11 says, And Abimelech charged all his people, saying, He that toucheth this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Now, from what we've seen from Abimelech, at the very least in these stories, he might seem a little bit shady, but not too bad, because he's saying, I mean, he's already making this commandment. Now, he knew, he's already dealt with Abraham. But he's making a pretty bold statement here, saying, look, nobody's allowed to touch these people. You know, you're going to be put to death if you even come, you know, if you basically come close to them and lay your hands on them. So he's looking out for them. I think that's also of God as well, because God's looking out for, for his people. God's looking out for Isaac. He's looking out for Rebecca and doing what they're doing here. But um, let's keep reading. Verse 12, it says, Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year an hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Now, what an, what an amazing blessing of God to sow in the land. I mean, he's sowing his crops, whatever else, and he receives a hundredfold. That's a lot. Getting a hundred times back from what you're putting in, God is truly blessing. And he just came out from a land of famine. Right? He had just gone through or started to go through this famine and started to go through some want. But he listened to God. And God when he said, okay, well, I'm going to go sojourn somewhere else, God said, okay, no, I want you to stay here. He listened to him. He did what God said, even though he had a fear of these people. Even though he feared them enough to say that Rebecca wasn't his wife. He still obeyed God, and then as a result, God ends up blessing him. And it's not just from what he did, but we could see this blessing. You know, obviously God was going to bless him for Abraham's sake as well, but he's listening to what, to what God tells him to do, and he receives this blessing. Let's keep reading him a little bit, because um, even though he does, he, you know, a hundredfold, that's a lot. Verse 13, it says, And the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. So God really blesses. I mean, he gets a lot of abundance of things of, of this world's goods and treasures. And it says in verse 14, for, and, you know, so the reason why he became so great, he had all these things, for he had possession of flocks and possession of herds and great store of servants. So he has all these people working for him. He's got all these servants. He's got all these flocks. He's got all these animals. He's, he's just really being blessed and, and have abundance of, of stuff. But I'll tell you what, Having all those riches, it's not always what it's cracked up to be. People, you know, we, we have a tendency to get focused on, man, why, can, you know, why can't I be like Isaac and God bless me and I have all of this stuff? It's not always what it's cracked up to be. It sounds great on the surface. You look at it from the outside and be like, well, who wouldn't want to have a ton of money, right? Well, look at the, the next phrase in that, in that verse number um, 14. It says at the end of the verse, and the Philistines envied him. When you have a lot of money, you're going to have a lot of people envying you. And that's not a good thing. Honestly, it's not. You don't want people looking at you and just wishing that they had all this stuff that you have. You may think it's kind of harmless, but they look at you different. And then you got to, you know, people treat you different. That's where you get a bunch of people out of the woodworks. So everyone wanting to be your friend, for one. You got you to gotta be a lot more on guard for who's legitimate who really wants to be your friend and who doesn't be and who just wants to get your stuff and and you know be there because because you have goods and you talk you hear about these people who make it like in the music industry that maybe started off kind of poor and then all of a sudden like all these people all of a sudden all these relatives you never talked to in your whole life come out and they want to be your friend and they want to you know they want to get to know you and everything else but not just that look at what they actually do they and they look at him and when they're envying him, they're not looking at him just in a, in a positive light. They're looking at it like, man, this guy's got a lot of stuff. People will actually look at you in contempt because they'll say, well, why does he have so much stuff? Right? And this is a lot of part of the liberal philosophy too. Well, why does that person have so much stuff? We need to take that away from because I, I need more stuff. Why should you have so much stuff? You know, I work real hard. Why don't I have it? And, it's, and this is the type of attitude too where, where people can, can have it. Look. If God blesses you, praise the Lord, right? And that's the way that we, you know, if you don't have very much stuff and you know someone else that does, 
Don't get envious of them, for one, because that's covetousness. But also, don't get bitter against them either. We ought to have an attitude of just say, hey, God blessed you. Well, praise God. Good for you. I'm happy that you have those things. Even if I don't have any of those things, I'm happy for you that you have them, that God has decided to bless you. Be thankful for the things that you have and don't be so concerned about what everybody else has. But look at what they did. It says, after it says the Philistines envied him in verse 15, this is continuing on. It says four, right? So it's a, it's a continuation of the same thought. For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. So now, you know, we see these guys that all of the wells that he had, because you know, Abraham lived in the same place for a long time and he dug all these wells for their flocks and for everything else. These guys come and they stop them up. Now what's the purpose of that? Why would they need to stop up the wells if not just to spite them? Because, you know, and what, what's real interesting is, is that these same people then probably that are stopping up the wells, then they're fighting with Isaac later over the wells that he's digging. It's like, well, why did you stop up the other wells? You wouldn't even have to fight over these ones that he's digging now if you would have just left them alone. But they didn't do that. It says, um, For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. So Abimelech sent him. He sees, you know, God's blessing him. He's got, a, he's got all this stuff. And Abimelech's like, okay, you, you need to go. You're getting too powerful. You've got too much stuff. And he's probably getting kind of worried that, that you know, now Isaac's going to be able to, to run things. Abimelech's the king. And he doesn't want to have any type of challenge to his authority or anything like that. And especially when he comes mighty, you know, what happens if he becomes his enemy? So he's saying, okay, yeah, you're, you're staying here. And remember, Isaac's a foreigner in this land because it is the land of Gerar under the control of, of, of Abimelech. So Abimelech's saying, okay, you know, it's time for you to, to, to go off somewhere else. So it says in verse 17, And Isaac departed thence, and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar, and dwelt there. So now he goes into the valley. And it says in verse 18, And Isaac digged again the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham, and he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. Now, we see here that they waited for Abraham to die before they filled, they, before they filled back up those wells. They left them open while Abraham was still alive. But as soon as he died, they're just like, forget about it. We're, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to stop all this stuff. But now we see again, Isaac's doing the same work that his father did. Isaac's going out. Now he's digging the wells. He went into the, to this land of sojourn. He goes here and he's digging up the same exact wells that his father had dug. And what I like what it says about here, it says, and he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. You see, mu so much we can learn from this, at least symbolically from this story that happens. It's just, overall, there's not a lot that happens. It's really just a repeat of everything that Abraham had done and everything that Abraham had gone through. But we could learn from this and we need to learn from this. One of the things you have to learn from is that you can't just coast in the Christian life. You can't just, just be riding on someone else's coattails. Isaac had a great father. Abraham did a lot for God and he was just a hard-working guy. He, you know, he gained a lot of respect from his servants and from everybody, right? From the people around him. But just because you have a great father doesn't mean that you can just not have to do any of that work and just, just rely on the fact that, well, my dad was real great. You can't do that. You know, maybe your dad was a great preacher that did a lot for God, right? Maybe you have a, a, a dad that was you know, similar to Abraham. But that doesn't mean that you don't have to do work too because of all the work that your father had done. Abraham was a great man. He did a lot of work for God. But here's the thing. The enemy is always going to be trying to, to push you back and to stop the progress that's been made. And this goes from generation to generation to generation. Sometimes, you know, even within this country or, or in other countries, you know, 
There's been generations of people, men who are on fire for God, and you kind of get some sort of revival, and you get a lot of people who are, who are you know, excited about doing God's work, and who actually start making a difference, and start changing the culture to be a little bit more God-like, and people having more of a fear of God, but then it stops there, because their children grow up just listening to that stuff and just thinking, well, everything's great now. And then they, they back off and they don't fight the fights that they need to do and they don't dig the wells and do the work that they need to do. Because what's constantly happening is when you're doing all this great work, now here obviously this is physical, let's apply it spiritual. You know, they're digging this, they're doing this hard work of digging this deep well and they're getting it done and they're getting it done right and they're going down to find water and they finally get it and they get this well established which is a, the result of a lot of effort and hard work. And then the enemy comes and says, you know what? I'm not going to let them get ahead, and they fill it back up. It's there for a while. It's there while, while the zealous, you know, on fire, hard worker is there and still working. As soon as he's out of the picture, boom, we got we to fill this stuff back up. That's what the enemy's saying. We got to get rid of this, this progress that they've made, and we need to bring things back a few notches. It's this continual fight of the good versus evil, which is why you can never back down, which is why I love the fact that, and, and you know, we need to always be looking towards the old path, the old ways of doing things, the old-fashioned ways of the Bible. I don't care about your contemporary stuff. I don't care about your new way of doing things because it's not as good as the old ways. And Isaac knew this. That's why he went and said, you know what? The enemies you know, set us back a little bit, but I'm going to roll up my sleeves and we're going to redig this well again. It was worth doing the first time. It's worth doing again. We're going to redig these wells. And you know what else? We're going to call them by the same names. We're not going to change anything about it. Dad had it right the first time. The Bible has it right. We need to go back and do things this way. We don't need to be changing names. We don't need to be calling things different, you know, using all these other words to try to, try to make it sound trendy. You know, like people have this, the, the not of this world stickers and they try to make it look all worldly, which is the, the biggest, it's the biggest joke in the world, right? They take this phrase from the Bible, not of this world, right? That Jesus says, because I'm not of this world and ye are not of this world. You say, that's why the world's going to hate you. And what do they do? They take that phrase and they try to make it the most, look the most worldly thing that you could possibly make it. Right? They give it this script that just looks all trendy and cool and that's in the, 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 the way that, that any rock band or anyone else would have their logo. And that's what they make this statement look like. They make it look worldly. They, they completely destroy the whole meaning of the phrase, not of this world. Right? But we need to get back to these old ways. Don't, don't worry about some new way of calling things and new way of doing things. You know, people always have a new way of reaching people. Look, we don't need new ways of reaching people. We need to do things the old-fashioned way. We need to, you know, like Jesus sent people out two and two. We need to keep doing that. Don't forsake those old ways of doing things. And is it a lot of work? Yeah, it's a lot of work. But the enemy is continually trying to stop that and to fill up those holes and to, and to stop the work and, and to make us digress and to lose any ground that we've gained in this spiritual battle. We cannot let up. You can't rely on other people. You can't rely on, on a great you know, preacher or pastor or whatever that's doing great work. Don't just rely on them. You do the work too because they're going to be gone. And what's going to happen when they're gone? It's the same thing. And this happens over and over and over again. What happened when Moses was gone? Moses was gone for only 30 days and what happened to the children of Israel? We don't know what happened to that Moses. Right? We don't know what happened to them. They start getting into all kinds of sin. Idolatry and fornication and, and it was just it was a big mess. For one, that's why we need more people just, just getting involved and doing the work. But also just not, you know, let's stick with the old ways. Let's stick with the old paths. Let's dig, dig up these old wells. And that's why I love, you know, it seems it's a pretty, you know, Reading the story, you could look at this in the chapter and just say, oh, yeah, well, he did, you know, there's a lot of meaning behind this. And this whole, this whole chapter has a lot of that meaning. Let's not just read over these events. Now, these events happen and they're true, yes, but there's a lot that we could learn 
from the events that happen in the Bible. And let's make sure when we're reading the Bible that we're really trying to, to think about these things and pull out as much as we can. Uh, but let's keep reading here. <clears throat> Verse 19. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there a well of springing water. And the herdmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Esek, because they strove with him. Look at that. Verse 19 says, And Isaac's servants digged in the valley, and they found there a well. So who did the work according to the Bible? Isaac's servants. But then verse 20 says, And the herdmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. So they let Isaac's servants do all the work in digging. Now look, I'll be honest with you, I've never dug a well before. But I've seen a lot of wells. And I know it's a lot of work to dig a well. Even today, if you have the, the big drills and equipment to do it, it's still not like a simple task. They didn't have all of these big power tools to, to come and drive up and, and dig down the earth. Digging these wells is a lot of work. This is not just a, you know, get something done in a couple hours type of a task. <laughs> There's a lot of work because they have to dig and then they put the, you know, lay the stones around and, you know, and make sure that, that it's, that it's going to hold and stay secure and, and, and everything else. So um, there's a lot that goes into it. I don't, I don't have to be an expert in well making to know that that's a lot of work, right? And it's a very valuable resource, especially where they're at. I mean, they don't have all this plumbing. They're not on the grid, right? They're not, they're not living in a town. Well, yeah, of course, I'll turn my faucet on. I've got water coming out. That's not the way it was. They're living on the land. I mean, they're, they're building homes and stuff, but, you know, they're, they're living out there. They've got all this cattle. They need water. And uh, they need a lot of water. So these wells are, are great resources for them. They're very valuable to have because it's going gonna, it's gonna to sustain them. But we see the, the, the herdmen of the land, they're, they're fighting with them. They're, oh, you dig the well? Yeah, I want that. That's my water. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's mine. You did all the work. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to benefit from that. Let's keep reading here. Because this happens more than once. And it says in verse 21, And they digged another well, and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna. And he removed from thence and digged another well. And for that they strove not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth. And he said, For now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. So he finally, you know, keeps moving, keeps moving, and he gets to a place, digs a well, and nobody's going to fight with him over it. So he's finally like, finally, you know, we've got room for everybody to be here. You know, we're not, we're not, uh, you know, have to worry about people fighting us for this well now. He says in verse 23, and he went up from thence to Beersheba. And the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he builded an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants digged a well. Then Abimelech went to him from Gerar and Ahazath, one of his friends, and Phicol, the chief captain of his army. And Isaac said unto them, Wherefore come ye to me, seeing ye hate me and have sent me away from you? So I say, well, wait, why are you coming to see me now? You're like, well, you hate me. You want nothing to do with me. You're the one that sent me out and told me to get out of here. Now, what are you doing coming to me now? Verse 28, and they said, We saw certainly that the Lord was with thee. And we said, Let there be now an oath betwixt us, even betwixt us and thee, and let us make a covenant with thee, that thou wilt do us no hurt, as we have not touched thee, and as we have done unto thee nothing but good, and have sent thee away in peace, thou art now the blessed of the Lord. Now, this is a perfect illustration of how things are going to work for righteous people when you're dealing with the world. Just the world in general, the unsaved world, you know, because all they are, the world is ever looking out for is themselves. That's all they ever care about. And this becomes very clear here with Abimelech, right? At first, you know, they're worried about him. At first, they're not, they're, you know, 
They don't care about his wells. They, they stop them up. Right? Abraham's gone. We're just going to stop up all these wells. And he comes out and they're like, and he actually starts to grow. And they're like, uh, yeah. At first, they, they, he was welcome to stay there. Now, now you've got to get out of here. Because again, they're worried about themselves. You've got to get out of here. So he gets out of here. Then the herdmen are like, well, this well belongs to you. This is our well. They're fighting with him and they're taking the, you know, the fruit of his own labor, the work that he's done. And they're setting him away. And then finally, they're looking at this and going, you know what? He still keeps growing and God's blessing him and he's got all this stuff. We better make sure that we can just get a peace treaty with them because, again, they're looking out for themselves. They're worried that, you know, after all this stuff that they've been doing to him, he might come back and, and get them. They're saying, no, we need to make sure that he's not going to do anything against us. You know, the, the world, this is how they are. This is how people act. And we need to understand this, for one, because it's going to happen. People are always going to be out there that are looking to leech off of the hard work of others. They're, you know, like all those herdmen, they didn't dig those wells. If they needed them, they should have dug them. If they needed to water their flocks and their herds, then they should have done the hard work. They should have waited for someone else to come around and then bully them off and, and, and you know, threaten violence against them if he didn't give them the well. Because that's what they were doing. At least that's what they did to Abraham. That's what they did in the previous story in verse 21. I don't see why they would have changed that much since Isaac has to keep moving and they keep fighting with him over these wells. Abraham's the one who, who told Abimelech and he said, look, you know, your, your servants violently took this away from me. He's doing the hard work, but that's how the world is. They're going to be looking for that opportunity and they don't mind. There's a lot of people, a lot of wicked people don't mind just leeching off the hard work of others. And they're going to be willing to just to jump in and scoop and take, it, take whatever they can away from you. We need to be aware of that. But what we can learn and what we can see is the way that Isaac handled the situation. Does Isaac get in a war with these people because of these wells? No. No. The Bible says, you know, when you do wrong and you suffer for it, he says, hey, take it patiently. The Bible says, you know, you don't need to seek vengeance because vengeance belongs unto God. God will pay, will repay. God will recompense the evil that people will do unto you. It's not our job to right every wrong. Now, you may feel that way. When someone wrongs you, you got this, I'm going to, you know, I'll show them. Or, you know, well, hey, I did this hard work. You're not going to take it. And, you know, when it comes to they're going to be threatening violence, though, go ahead and take it. And that's what, that's what Isaac ended up doing. He kept moving. He said, okay, fine. I'll just dig one over here. He digs one over here. Well, that wasn't good enough. They want that one, too. And he says, fine, take that one. I'm going to go over here. And he does it. And then we see, you know, Abimelech showing up. And he's like, what are you doing here? You hate me. Why are you even talking to me? But then they're like, well, we, want it. we just want to live at peace. You know, we want to have a peace treaty so that, that you, you, know, you promise you won't come and attack us and we promise the same thing. We won't, you know, we won't harm you. And the Bible tells us as much as it lieth in you, as much as is possible to live at peace with all men. Right? We're not out to be starting wars and, and to be getting people back for the way that they've wronged us. We need to try to live at peace as much as possible. So what is, how does Isaac even handle that situation? Look at verse 30. It says, And he made them a feast, and they did eat, and drink. He was hospitable. He, gives, he throws a party and says, great, let's live at peace. And he accepts it. Even though he's been done wrong, he accepts the peace, which is exactly all of those things. Abraham did the same thing. He had the same spirit. He had the same, you know, and, and that commands respect when people see that. You can see, you know, someone who's not a hothead, someone who's not just flying off the handle, someone who's able to let God deal with the, with the, recompense, let God deal with the judgment. But when you can just keep working, don't let that set you back and be like, well, forget it. I'm not going to dig anything then because every time I try to do something, do some good work, then these people just come and take it away. Forget it. I'm giving up. He didn't do that either. He says, you know what? I'm just going to keep working. I'm just going to do it over here. I keep doing what I'm doing. I'm going to keep working. God will take care of these people. And God does. God always does. You don't need to worry about making that right with them. We don't need to get caught up in these fights 
in this physical world over property and over, you know, me ultimately meaningless stuff. Right? And hey, God blessed them. Did, did he have to have fight over that well of water? Or do you think that God is still just going to keep blessing them anyways? You know, he didn't need that. You don't need to, to stay focused on the one thing that people are taking away from you and be all focused and, and bent out of shape about that. Just keep on working and keep on doing what's right. And this is what was, what was great and what we could learn about the way that Isaac dealt with things. And it's the same way that his father had dealt with it. it you know, I'm going to read from you. You could turn there if you want to Genesis 21 because the same exact thing. And it's the same exact people. And you know what? It's at the same exact place. It's at Beersheba where Abimelech came unto Abraham and asked for the same exact thing. And he asked him to, to have this peace treaty between them. Now, you could see how much they really cared about Abraham when they just went and, you know, they waited till he died, but then they just stopped up all his wells. All they were worried about was him attacking them. They were scared. But they didn't, they didn't, other than that, you know, they didn't care for him. Which is evidenced by the way that they treated him with, the, with his wells and, and everything else. But in, in Genesis 21, 22, the Bible reads, And it came to pass at that time that Abimelech, and Phicol, the chief captain of his host, spake unto Abraham, saying, God is with thee in all that thou doest. This is the same exact two people. There's a, a third one added, though, in, in Genesis 26. But those two, the same two people, the, the captain of the army and the king, come and speak unto them. And, you know, they, they say, they're saying the same thing. Look, we know that God's blessing you. We know that God's with you. So Genesis 21, 23 reads, Now therefore swear unto me here by God that thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son, but according to the kindness that I have done unto thee, thou shalt do unto me and to the land wherein thou hast sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. And Abraham reproved Abimelech because of a well of water, which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. So Abimelech's servants were violently taken away from Abraham back in his day. They're doing the same thing to Isaac again. And then in verse 31 it says, Wherefore he called that place Beersheba, because there they both they swear both of them. And this is the exact same place. Um, if we keep reading, we'll finish up the chapter here in Genesis 26. It says in verse 31, And they rose up betimes in the morning and swear one to another, and Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. And it came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which they had digged, and said unto him, We have found water. And he called it Sheba. Therefore the name of the city is Beersheba unto this day. So many things are identical in the life of, of in the story here with Isaac as well as, as Abraham, down to the exact place. But we see that Isaac learned a lot from Abraham. He dealt with things appropriately, and we need to learn to deal with things the same way. Another thing I could see is, you know, the, the, the battle doesn't really change that much. You know, the devices of Satan, you know, we're not ignorant of his devices. We know the way he's going to attack. He's going to keep on attacking the same way. It's not going to be anything new. It's not going to be anything different. The struggles that we face today, they're not really any different than, than the previous generations have faced. We go through the same stuff, but it's how, the, how you handle it is, what's mat is what matters. How you deal with it. How you're able to, to deal with those struggles. Now, we don't have to be ignorant about them. This stuff happens over and over and over again. We need to work and dig for righteousness while the enemy's trying to fill up our holes. But even if they fill up some of our holes, we just need to get right back out there and keep digging away. The worst thing that you can do is give up. Because as soon as you give up, oh man, then they're going to they're gonna really move in and just fill up everything. We, you know, you may be weary, you may get a little tired, but we cannot stop. We need to continue to work. We need to continue to seek out the old paths. Now the last two verses, verse 34 says, And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Bashamath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah. Now if you remember, Isaac was 40 years old when he got married to Rebekah. But the difference is that 
you know, for one, Abraham made sure. He's like, look, I don't want my son to marry the daughters of the heathen that around, you know, they're staying in this land and there's these wicked people of the land and I don't want him to marry them. So Abraham sent his servant to, to basically get Rebecca for Isaac. Now, we see here though, and Esau's got a big pattern of kind of having a carnal mind and a carnal attitude. Instead of, you know, either waiting until he can, he can you know, find the right person, he's, he's marrying these heathen women. And that's why we see, we'll see later that Jacob is sent away to find a wife. Since Esau here, he's, already, he's marrying the heathen. And Rebecca's like, look, this is going to be too much for me, too much of a grief of mine if Isaac does the same thing. Or I mean, excuse me, if Jacob does the same thing. And um, so he gets sent away. We'll see that in the, you know, in the future chapters. But um, yeah, this is, this is thrown in here at the end that Esau, we could see already, he's not like his father. He's not behaving and in, 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 in acting himself the way that, that Isaac did in marrying these heathen women. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this chapter of the Bible. God, I pray that you would please just um, strengthen our faith. Lord, help us to continually be seeking out the old ways, the old paths, dear God, and um, doing things the way that you've prescribed. And it doesn't matter how many thousands of years old it is, dear Lord. It's the right way. It's the good way. And if, if it's coming from your word, then that's what we need to be doing, dear Lord, and um, not trying to improve upon your methods or to do things better or think we have a better way of doing things, but to just be humble and to seek out those old paths, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.